For this inaugural TEDx Whistler, we chose the theme, Tourism's Place in a Sustainable World. We felt that it was a very timely and relevant topic, not only for us in Whistler, but for all tourism-based economies and businesses and the tourism industry around the world as we grapple with this question. As the world's attention right now is on the, winter, the 2010 Winter Olympics, in Whistler, we're getting unprecedented recognition and attention to the community and recognition as a, as a, uh, a leader in recreation and tourism. However, what many people probably don't know is that we in Whistler have been on an ongoing and long-time journey towards sustainability. So while that might seem like a dichotomy or even an oxymoron, how can we be a resort-based community and move towards sustainability, it is this very challenge that we are committed to addressing and exploring in the community of Whistler, and TEDx Whistler is just the first step, or one of the steps among many, along the way in this journey. Our speakers were invited to this event to bring us their experiences, their expertise, and their perspectives in about tourism in a sustainable world. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today, Mark Angelo, the chair of the British Columbia Institute for Technology, Rivers Institute. Mark will share with us his experiences about his travels along seven rivers in seven continents around the world and how we can learn about traveling more lightly. Here's Mark Angelo. Thank you, Ching. And it is nice to be in Whistler, especially during the Olympics. And in the spirit of that great event, Today, uh, we will take a bit of a global odyssey to some wondrous places, and we will meet some fascinating cultures. And while I'm going to focus on adventure travel, I also want to touch on the importance of wildness as a bit of a sub-theme. Whether that be large wilderness or small pockets of natural spaces close to where so many of us live, as the mayor just alluded to. And areas like that really are an important part of the Canadian fabric and they contribute greatly to the quality of life that we all enjoy. Now, as many of you know, I've had a love of the outdoors since I was young, and I've had a great interest in adventure travel for almost as long. And I've always believed that any sort of travel or vacation benefits us all in terms of personal renewal and rejuvenation. And sometimes a traveling experience may even transform a person and inspire some significant changes in their life. But seeing new places also helps to broaden perspectives, and it makes us even more appreciative of other lifestyles and cultures. And thinking back to some of the experiences I've had, there have been many times I found myself marveling at just what an incredible planet we live on. And I particularly felt that way during trips to some of the wilder and more remote destinations that I've been to. And as a traveler, there has just always been an attraction to those kinds of places. But in that regard, a key point to also make today is that tourism can be a double-edged sword, no question about it. But if it's done right, if it embraces the principles of sustainability and if it gives back to support things like cultural heritage preservation, then it can contribute to the economic well-being of communities and rural people while also helping to protect wild places. Now, in terms of my own travels, while I've taken a lot of hiking trips over the years, I've also often chosen to travel by rivers. Paddling has been an avocation of mine since I was young. And in terms of seeing new things, I've always subscribed to the notion that each mile on the river can take you further from home than 100 miles in a car. And certainly the advent of the modern inflatable raft when I was young was great to see. And from a timing point of view, that was pretty fortuitous. So I took my first multi-day raft trip as a teenager. And as my wife Kathy might say, it's been downriver ever since. So with that, we will now commence with a whirlwind 16-minute journey, a personal journey across the planet, traveling by foot and by river to some amazing places. I hope you enjoy it. And we'll begin, the slide's already up, we'll begin in a somewhat unexpected place, Hollywood, California. Some may call this a wild place. <laughs> the city where my personal journey began long ago, and as a young boy, I spent lots of time hiking through those Hollywood hills. And while L.A. may have been a great place to grow up in the 50s, I longed for some place a little greener. So I headed to the beautiful state of Montana to go to university. 
And I have to say, those were formative years. As you can see, my hair was a little redder and a lot thicker back then. And it was then that I decided I wanted to work in a conservation-related field. And while I always loved rivers, I came to see them in a slightly different light, as so eloquently stated here by Norman MacLean in his book, A River Runs Through It. In the early 70s, I was then drawn to Vancouver by its beautiful natural setting. And I loved the idea of living just a stone's throw from the Fraser, one of the world's great rivers. And I have to say, ours is a province and a country of incredible natural values and wild places, often right at our back door. And this is Garibaldi, just a stone's throw from where we are right now. We also live in a place with some incredible wildlife values. And I have had some great bear encounters over the years, as have many of you, and they are amazing animals. Our country also has amazing cultural values and a great indigenous history. And this Chehalis pictograph beside the nearby Harrison River dates back literally thousands of years. And one of my favorite rivers is the Tachinshini. And 17 years ago, concerns about a proposed mine, along with the area's great environmental values and its potential for wilderness tourism, all helped to protect this spectacular area. And Canada's north, also one of the most special places to visit anywhere in the world. And to travel through its wilderness landscapes on a river like the Firth on the northern Yukon is pretty special. So with that, we will now commence with our journey to a few of the world's other magical places. And we'll start at the very bottom of the earth in Antarctica, sometimes referred to as the Lost Continent. And I actually traveled there to follow the footsteps of Finn Ronnie, the last of the great polar explorers, and a great family friend when I was young. And here the landscape can be literally otherworldly. And where the ice and the rocks of Antarctica meet the ocean, you have the most productive marine ecosystem in the world. And it is an amazing place to see whales. And this particular whale was feeding on krill. So we cut our engines to watch him from quite a distance, but he kept coming closer and closer and then disappeared, only to resurface right beside our boat with his mouth open and water and krill splashing on us and all the while close enough to touch. It was an amazing experience. And penguins, these guys are lovable creatures and well adapted to the harsh Antarctic landscape. But the Antarctic Peninsula is much more accessible today than when my friend Finn Ronnie was there decades ago. And many of its sites are very sensitive. So to prevent impacts, tour companies share itineraries and they avoid some sites while restricting use at others. And that's good to see, but I think we'll have to do even more of that in future. We had an amazing journey there. But as rugged and desolate as Antarctica can be, you also can't help but appreciate how fragile and vulnerable it is from a climate change perspective. And that's an issue that we'll have to come to grips with. We now move to South America, a continent with a great diversity of natural wonders, including Chile and Patagonia. Yet this area is also the site of a fierce debate around a series of proposed dams that would provide power to Chile's more populated north, 2,000 kilometers away. But within Patagonia, there is widespread opposition to the dams, and locals would much rather nurture a burgeoning ecotourism sector while protecting their traditional ranching heritage. Still within South America is the Galapagos off the coast of Ecuador. And my daughter Lindsay and I had a great trip there. But with visitation increasing rapidly, additional limits on use will be needed if we are to protect the great values found there. While there, we also came across this tortoise which locals believe was born around the time that Darwin first visited these islands back in 1836. And to sit beside an animal that old is quite a surreal experience. 
Mind you, my daughter was probably thinking the same thing about me. I've also been fortunate to spend quite a bit of time along the Amazon, literally the lungs of our planet. And we've had amazing trips there, the first of which goes back to 1979. And one of the most impressive sites in the Amazon basin is Venezuela's famed Angel Falls, the highest in the world. But the Amazon as a whole is changing rapidly. And every year, huge areas are burned to make way for agriculture, while other parts are exposed to logging, roads, and dams. So from a sustainability point of view, how the future pans out here remains very uncertain. Now, one of my most memorable experiences in South America took place in Chile on the Beal Beal, often referred to as the Lost River of the Puenche. And it was here in 94 that I took one of the very last river trips, raft trips on this river before the completion of the controversial Penge Dam. And that dam and others flooded the ancestral lands of the Puenche, who are part of Chile's indigenous Mapuche people, a people who are struggling to protect their identity, their culture, and their traditional lands. And like so many people around the world who have been impacted by large dams, often, often without adequate compensation, I believe we owe a great debt to the damned that I hope one day is settled. And we now travel across the planet to Mali in West Africa and a memorable trip on the Niger River. And during my visit, I also spent quite a bit of time with the Dogen people of Mali who live along the Bandiagara Escarpment. And certainly one of my most memorable experiences in Africa was the opportunity to be a sole witness of the Dogen Mass Dance, a centuries-old ritual that helps guide the souls of the recently departed to their final resting place. And Africa has many other vibrant indigenous cultures, including the San of the Kalahari in Botswana, who recently won the right to return to their ancestral lands after being forcibly evicted by government. And last spring, as a traveler, I had a wonderful opportunity to spend time with one of the few clans that still practice a traditional way of life. And they are an amazing people with the history dating back 30,000 years or more. And from a sustainability perspective, they are the ultimate leavers. In Namibia, meanwhile, the Himba people are fighting a controversial dam on the Kunini River. And to spend time around a Himba village fire is a magical experience. And it's because of encounters like this that there is a growing interest in indigenous tourism. But that must be done respectfully and sensitively. And having had the opportunity to spend time with so many indigenous cultures on the edge, I've often thought of the great work done by people like Wade Davis, and certainly this quote from Margaret Mead says a lot about vanishing cultures. We now head to the Zambezi River on the border of Zimbabwe and Zambia, this being the world-renowned Victoria Falls. And at the base of these falls, you can depart on a raft trip that has some of the world's best white water. It's an amazing stretch of river. And just after a river trip, my wife and I headed into town for a beer and came across this sign. <laughs> it's one of many reasons why I love Africa. We then traveled down the Lower Zambezi by canoe. And the Lower Zambezi is, is an amazing wildlife area that highlights how peace and security influence tourism. Because in the mid-80s, when Zambia was in turmoil, all the tourist camps were on the Zimbabwe side. But now, with Zambia stabilized and with unrest in Zimbabwe, many tourists now flock to the Zambian side. And of all the animals I've encountered along rivers as a paddler, the hippo is probably the one that I have the healthiest fear and greatest respect for. They are incredibly powerful and deceivingly fast. And I found out the hard way when a raft was charged and punctured on the upper Zambezi. And I've often woken up at night thinking about this guy and those massive teeth snapping down on a raft just about a foot away from where I was sitting. And three of us went in the water. 
Thankfully, everybody was okay, but it was a, a very memorable trip. So we crossed the world again, this time to New Guinea, a place I first visited in 1980. And this is the Sepik River, the largest remaining pristine river system in the, in the Asia Pacific, or the Aust uh, in Australasia, I should say, or the Asia Pacific. And it's a river with a great cultural value, incredible cultural values, and perhaps an unparalleled diversity among its indigenous people. And the children of the Sepik spend day after day in the river, learning to swim and paddle as infants. And this woman was actually returning to her village with a load of fish. And because of the heat, she was actually smoking her fish in the boat so they wouldn't spoil. And as recently as the 1960s, there were still instances of head hunting and cannibalism here. And while those practices have ceased, you can still find an occasional display of enemy skulls from days gone by, or as one of the elders called them, the good old days. The Sepik is truly a magical and pristine place, but that could easily change with timber and mining interests now closely eyeing the area. For now, though, the Sepik and its people remain a remarkable window into the past. We now travel to my favorite place in the Himalayas, Bhutan, the last Shangri-La. Now, Bhutan is trying to only cautiously embrace tourism and modernization, and they have deliberately chosen to take a low-volume, high-value approach to tourism to try and better protect their culture and environment and it seems to be working. And the people of Bhutan seem to have embraced their king's refreshing message that the country should focus more on gross national happiness as opposed to gross national product. And this is the tiger's nest, Bhutan's most famous monastery literally clinging to a cliff. I was also there during the annual Paro Festival a cultural and religious tradition that has gone on for centuries. And I have to say my time in Bhutan reminded me of the movie Lost Horizon, a film I loved as a boy about a mythical Himalayan kingdom where one could find eternal happiness. And if such a place existed, I think it would be Bhutan. We now head to the vibrant and exotic country of India, and this being sun up on the Ganges. India's most sacred waterway. And in the holy city of Varanasi, my wife and I were on the river at dawn every morning, just as thousands of locals would come down to the river for their holy dip, which cleanses the spirit. And the locals do have a great reverence for the river, which is great to see. Although the river itself is not necessarily treated in accordance with that devotion. On the same trip, we also visited Ranthambore, one of India's great tiger reserves, only to discover that a poaching operation had killed half the tigers in the park shortly before our visit, a terrible occurrence. But we did get a brighter picture a year later in Bandavgar National Park, and this time we had many sightings. And if the tiger is to make a comeback, wild places like this will play a key role. We now quickly move to Mongolia and another interesting story unfolding along the Egg and Ur rivers, great wilderness waterways with a rapidly growing ecotourism sector. And fly fishermen from around the world are drawn here by one of the last great runs of Taman, the world's largest salmonid. And they are amazing fish. But increased fishing pressure required a move to a more sustainable catch and release fishery. There were also concerns here about unchecked resource development. Also locals wanted to share in the benefits of tourism, while nomadic herders wanted to protect their lifestyle and their culture. So a few years ago, all those stakeholders got together and agreed to a groundbreaking plan to protect the river and to better manage tourism 
sounds a little bit like your 2020 initiative. And we eventually found funding to implement that. So this was a positive, positive ending that I think sets a great precedent. And halfway around the world, I found another reason for optimism on Costa Rica's Pacuari River, renowned for its white water. And we had come to celebrate the news that the Pacuari had been protected from a very controversial dam proposal that would have had a devastating impact on the river and its burgeoning tourism industry. And this is one of our paddlers who chose to wear his Mickey Mouse garb for the trip. But this river is anything but Mickey Mouse. And it certainly lived up to its great reputation. In addition, it was also exciting to see a river that had been saved as opposed to lost. And tourism values played a role in that. So as we near the end of this whirlwind journey, I'm reminded that tourism can help to protect wild places and great rivers. And if done the right way, it can benefit local people and future generations, whether that be in Mongolia or deep in the Amazon. And so our journey brings us back to British Columbia, where I think we are so fortunate to have wild places close to our back door. And while in other parts of the world, wild places may be rarer, they can still be found. And I believe such places do much to rejuvenate the soul. And I think an, an old friend, Ed Abbey, said it best. Wilderness is not a luxury, but a necessity of the human spirit, as vital to our lives as water and good bread. Thank you very much.